to you by University of Missouri Extension. My name is Jill Scheidt. I'm an agronomy specialist in Southwest Missouri, and I will be your host today. Matt Herring, who's changed his name to ask questions here, is an agronomy specialist from East Central Missouri. And if you would like to, add, and he'll be my co-host today. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the chat by clicking the icon in the lower middle of your screen. You can choose to submit your question to everyone or choose Matt's name, ask questions here to submit it anonymously. We have a great program for you today, starting with a weather report from Pat Gwinan, MU climatologist, followed by Johnson Grass, Good, Bad, and Ugly from Tim Schnockenberg, agronomy field specialist in Southwest Missouri. So we're glad you guys could be here today. And Pat, if you're ready, we'll just go ahead and get started with your weather report. I will, thank you. Thank you, Jill. Could, uh, could you give me the privileges to share the screen? It's not letting me do it. Oh, wait, I got it, thank you. I'm good to go. Thank you, Jill. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll get right into it. We got a, a very active weather pattern over the next couple of days and some significant flooding is, is likely across parts of the state. That being said, just looking back in the upper left, you can see this well. Weather pattern did start to change, especially across the northern half of Missouri starting this past weekend. There has been some notable rainfall, generally across the northern half of the state. And you can see some of the totals of over two inches in those yellow shades, even higher totals of three to more than five inches in some of these darker reds and, and, and uh, oranges. Uh, on the right, upper right, you can see what we've uh, experienced so far this morning using Missouri Mesonet weather stations. Uh, it looks like the northwest quarter of the state saw so some of the biggest rainfall totals. We right up here almost an inch and a half at the Ford Systems Research Center, nine tenths in Trenton, uh, one, a little over an inch across at the Huntley Research Farm in Albany, and an inch and 35 hundredths at St. Joe. But uh, these totals are only going to go higher as we go through the course of the day and into the weekend. I do want to note at the bottom here, the drought conditions. This is the late drought monitor map. Believe it or not, we still have some dryness in the southern half of the state that's been missing out on these rainfalls. Uh, a little bit of dryness showing up here from St. Louis, southwestward and westward, and then another area just introduced uh, uh, in west central Missouri, generally just south of Kansas City and north of Lamar, there's some dry conditions. I think what, we, what you see here in parts of northern Missouri by by next week, a lot of that will be eliminate, eliminated because of the significant rainfall that is anticipated over the next uh, few days. I will note there are severe weather opportunities over the next couple of days. We've already seen that. Earlier this morning, our weather station in Marshall uh, had a peak wind gust of 67 miles per hour. There was a severe thunderstorm that popped up just to the west and southwest of that area and brought this uh, severe wind gust. Obviously, if you get that high a wind, you're gonna see tree damage. You're gonna see probably some property damage. And indeed, that was the case in portions of Marshall this morning. We have a very active spring-like weather pattern and it's going to bring chances of more severe weather this afternoon and flooding. That is likely. In the upper right is the severe storm possibility. This deeper shade of orange is the highest likelihood. We'll see severe thunderstorms across generally the northern half of the state a slighter risk as you go over southern parts, but nonetheless, there will be perhaps some severe weather over portions of southern Missouri. But again, the highest likelihood is in this deeper orange color. For today, I would they're anticipating another round of storms to fire up late this afternoon and continue overnight to bring us those storm chances. And then another round of severe weather potential here in the bottom right, you can see this is for tomorrow. Another area of storms are expected to um, develop tomorrow afternoon and bring us another chance of more severe weather. So again, a very active pattern over the next couple of days. I think I really wanna highlight is the flood potential. We have some high likelihood of some significant flooding perhaps across the Northern half of Missouri. The National Weather Service has already issued flash flood watches that go into Friday. And uh, you can see the Northern half of the state and all these darker green colors. Uh, the significant river flood outlook, here in the lower left does indicate the possibility of some significant flooding across uh, southeast Iowa, much of Illinois and on into Indiana. So that will impact the Mississippi, middle Mississippi and part portions of the Ohio River Basins and all the other smaller streams and tributaries. Uh, in the middle here, the next three days, look at these likelihood of excessive rainfall. They actually have a moderate risk 
for today and for tomorrow across northern Missouri and parts of southern Iowa. You don't see that red up very often and let alone be it for two consecutive days. They are indicated some high likelihood of several inches of rain to fall over the next couple of days, perhaps five to more than eight inches of rain. You get that much rain over that much real estate, you're gonna see some notable flooding. So please keep an, keep an eye on the situation and be aware of the likelihood of flooding over the next couple of days. Even into the third day, this is on, on the bottom here, there is a slight risk of a more excessive rainfall. So three consecutive days impacting portions of Missouri. On the right, the far right, I have consolidated a lot of river information resources. Of course, we have some bit, the main stem rivers that impact our state. Uh, and I've consolidated those links where you can get the latest river outlooks and uh, river conditions, river forecasts of what the streams and rivers are gonna do. And in not only the Missouri and the Mississippi, but it will look at the smaller uh, other streams and river, uh, tributaries impacting Missouri, like the Grand River, the Sheraton, the Salt, the Fabius, all those other rivers, they do have forecasts of what the levels are and what, what perhaps to expect over the next few days. The link for this uh, resource page is at the bottom here where you can get this consolidated information. Again, significant river flood outlooks already. Significant flooding is possible across Northwest Missouri over the next few days. And over here on the right, that's for the Mississippi River Basin and the, and the streams and tributaries, you can see significant river flooding is possible. This is why they're saying that, because look at this forecast over the next three days, just three days, they're indicating three to five inches of rain across the Northern half of the state. Look at that three inch contour extend all the way to much of Illinois, Southwest Michigan. They even have as much as six inches of rain in parts of East Central, Northeast uh, Illinois. You get that much rain over that much real estate, that's going to affect those main stem rivers and all the watersheds in there. So be, please be aware of the potential for some significant flooding over the next few days. This is the forecast for next week. It does indicate this somewhat unsettled pattern, cool pattern will remain established. The, the blues on the left indicate an enhanced likelihood of below normal temperatures over the next, as we go into next week, that could perhaps put highs in the low 80s and lows in the 60s, very pleasant for this time of year. And on the right, it does look like that somewhat of an unsettled pattern, especially over the southeastern half of the state with those enhanced likelihood of above normal precip, drier conditions as you go through northwestern Missouri. So uh, Jill, that's pretty much a weather wrap up. I would just want to emphasize, please be aware the next couple of days for the severe weather and flooding possibilities that are likely across a good portion of the state, especially the Northern half of Missouri. Thanks so much. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Pat. We always appreciate your weather forecasts um, every week. If there are no questions for Pat, um, then we'll continue to Tim Schnockenberg. Tim is our agronomy field specialist with the University of Missouri Extension. He's headquartered in Stone County, um, and he's going to talk to us today about Johnson grass. So Tim, if you're ready, I'll let, uh, I'll let you share screen and take it away. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, let me pull it up real quick and we will uh, be ready to roll. Okay, we're going to talk about Johnson grass today and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grass that we see across the state of Missouri in abundance. In many cases along the roadsides, we see it in hay fields. Uh, we see it in crop fields. Uh, we find that uh, most people either love it or hate it. And so, you know, when I address a, a crowd uh, in a room, I usually bring this question up. Do we control Johnson grass or do we grow it? And so um, I find that uh, in a crowd of, of, uh, of producers across the state of Missouri, they'll, they'll, there'll be about half of them who will absolutely hate it and want to control it. And there's a crowd of producers that want to grow it. In fact, I've had people ask me where they can get seed. So I, I feel like uh, I'm gonna be kind of riding the line here just a little bit, talking about the positives and the negatives of it. 
and let you kind of decide how you want to approach it. Uh, but I want to give you some background information uh, about Johnson grass. Sorghum halopens is the scientific name for it. It's been around, oh, since about 1830, 1840, somewhere in there um, in the United States coming from Turkey. Uh, but it is a perennial and it is a C4 warm season grass, prolific rhizome producer, prolific seed producer, and gets its name from a gentleman named Colonel William Johnson who planted it on the Alabama River about 1840 or so. And so as a result, it uh, escaped cultiv cultivation um, and has really kind of become a nuisance plant, in many cases, a noxious weed uh, in some states across the state. And when we talk about Johnson grass, the old 1967 Clint Eastwood movie comes to my mind because uh, there's really the good part of Johnson grass, the bad part of it, and there's definitely an ugly side to Johnson grass as well. So I want to kind of focus on that today and then we'll get a little bit into the management of it, the control and, and, and even the use of it. There is no question that I can't deny that Johnson grass is from a forage standpoint, a pretty good forage. Um, it really leads the pack in many ways when it comes to quality, when it comes to tonnage, when it comes to persistence and also drought tolerance. Um, it's got all of those in the bag. And uh, these are some numbers I got from the Southern Forages book that talks about you know, the quality of it and the tonnage produced uh, comparable to other forages that we grow. Um, I've looked for good palatability data and uh, some of the best that I was able to find was coming out of the Noble Foundation in o Oklahoma. They did a study about, oh, about a three-year study several years ago uh, on palatability of it. They averaged, it averaged about 11.6% protein, 58% uh, TDN, total digestible nutrients, and of the 16 grasses that they studied, it really ranked highest uh, in crude protein and second in TDN. And uh, in that case, uh, Bermuda grass was the top end that, in that study. They also did some, a couple of grazing preference uh, uh, projects, um, looking at 14 species with yearling steers in 2007. And I believe they did this study as, as well in, in 08. I just don't have that data. But it came second place. Uh, I don't know who was test who was uh, keeping track of the bites uh, by cattle, but they recorded a second place in the number of bites on Johnson grass. Um, so interesting that it is a a high producing, very good quality forage, and we can't deny that. Um, it is fairly drought tolerant. It may not just thrive in a drought tolerant or a drought situation, but it can, it can uh, survive and still produce some, some pretty decent forage during that time. This is a picture I got from uh, agronomist Terry Halloran several couple years ago, uh, showing what it can do in a, in a severe drought. Now the bad part of Johnson grass is that it produces both, it reproduces from both seed and rhizomes. And so uh, it has been, uh, found as deep as five foot deep, uh, those rhizomes, they can develop within 19 days of seedling emergence. Uh, we start getting rhizomes that develop on the plant. And so it's just a prolific uh, producer, reproducer. Um, and it holds a lot of, of uh, you know, there is some growing, uh, there's, there's some uh, storage capacity above ground, but there's a lot of storage below ground with on the average or somewhere around 275 feet of rhizomes from one plant. Uh, I've seen sources that say anywhere from 30 to 80,000 seeds can be produced from one plant and they can be viable within 10, within 10 years. So, you know, if, if, the, if the seed doesn't survive, the rhizomes definitely can survive. I mean, it's, it's a very prolific producer. And so it's taking light nutrients and water away from other plants. I got this quote actually from Dr. Kevin Bradley, uh, but he, uh, he quoted uh, Chester McWhorter, who was a very renowned USDA weed scientist 
now deceased, but in 1991, he made the comment. He said, I've spent the last 16 years of my career working in Johnson grass. And I can report that Johnson grass is a bigger problem today than when I began. So if you're trying to get rid of it, you're trying to figure out how to keep it under control. Uh, it's not very encouraging because it's, it's, it's a very difficult uh, issue that we work on in the ag industry. Here's another photo I got from Terry Halloran. Um, rhizomes that grow out of hay. And I believe this is from probably fescue hay that was sitting uh, on the farm uh, near Johnson grass and the rhizomes grew up into the hay. And so as a result, you know, when that hay is fed, it's gonna be transferred to from field to field. So it's it's got its unique ability to be you know, readily transferred from field to field just by the hay that is produced, whether it's been growing into the hay in the storage area, or if it's in the seed, um, seed that's in the, in the hay from the hay harvest. So we've got to think about that when we're trying to, uh, you know, if we want to keep it under control. Talking about the Missouri law, it, it's on the noxious weed control list. It's on the prohibitive status for Missouri for seed. And so basically that means, you know, we're supposed to keep it from going to seed. Uh, that's a challenge um, and really doesn't get done in the state in most cases, but we are supposed to do everything we can to keep it from going to seed. We're also to be, uh, you know, keep it from developing, coming in, in, in a, in a uh, grain crop, in the, in the seed of grain crop. Uh, we also, you know, there are some laws that uh, apply to uh, specific counties that have adopted a weed control board by a county-wide election. These are the counties I'm aware of, at least. I'm not going to say it's 100% accurate, but these are the ones that I know have had a county weed control board over the years. And so several up in North Missouri, several in Central, several in Southeast Missouri, um, where there have been, upon petition of 100 landowners, a countywide election where they form this county weed board and they may levy a property tax to help conduct Johnson grass eradication programs. Uh, in my areas where I've worked around the state, I know over in Pettis County, they had a, a, a very active group that um, would uh, basically hire somebody and they would spray, spray ditches and spray um, uh, land around the county all summer long, and then tours and things like that were were offered to try to educate about educate people about Johnson grass. So that's just an example of how this has worked uh, in some counties. And in other counties, there's not much activity at all. Now the ugly side of Johnson grass is the prussic acid and the nitrate toxicity that can occur. And I, I've got to preface this by saying that we've probably created a little bit of hysteria in the last few years when we've had some drought, maybe just trying to educate people about the possibility of losing cattle as a result of these two issues. And it, it is a serious concern, uh, particularly when we have drought level uh, issues, but um, I don't want to scare people thinking that this is just going to automatically happen because it doesn't. But once in a while, and I would say in my history, I would say probably 2012 was the year that we had a serious drought here in southwest Missouri where we did see several, several head of animals that, that did die as a result of either prussic acid or nitrate toxicity. But it doesn't happen in every drought in a wide extent. But we do want to educate people and let them know that these things could happen. You know, prussic acid is basically like a cyanide poisoning and uh, it's generally a problem in drought, again, dry weather, uh, until the, the plant reaches about 20, 24 inches. Uh, so short stuff we wanna kind of keep cattle off of during these situations until it gets a little height on it. So it's not a problem in pearl millet, it's not a problem in cured hay, but we do see this in Johnson grass and some sorghum lines. Uh, it's also a concern at first frost. You can uh, break those, the, the frost can break the cells open, 
create a cyanide toxicity issue until that fully dries down. Um, and this, this is sometimes an issue, a concern, but I haven't seen a lot of cattle deaths as a result of this that I could attribute it to, simply because I think a lot of times we have a lot of other things growing like the fescue below in this picture that is keeping their belly full with other things besides just frozen, you know, frosted uh, Johnson grass. Another one could be nitrate poisoning, generally a problem again in dry weather. So we keep our rates of nitrogen fairly low. Um, and so to avoid this problem, so if you're applying nitrogen on Johnson grass or the sorghums, the millets, uh, you need, need to worry about this a little bit and uh, have some safety, safety precautions in place. Let's talk a little bit about controlling Johnson grass. I think, you know, you can mow Johnson grass, but, you know, it kind of keeps it in a vegetative stage. But if, if the timing of the mowing is during a uh, point where we've already reached seed head production, and we've got some viable seed up there, we're really not accomplishing that much because we could potentially move it from field to field on the mower deck. And so that's, that's an issue with mowing. I do think, as I mentioned earlier, the Johnson grass that is in a lot of hay, we see that here in Southwest Missouri a lot. Um, it gets distributed probably more that way than any other thing I have seen. And so that's something to be aware of, particularly if you're buying hay and you're bringing it in and you don't want Johnson grass, that's where we tend to have a lot of problems. Um, I think there's some ways of controlling it in forages. Um, generally, the, you know, the, kind of the thinking is, is that you graze Johnson grass pretty heavy for about three years, you'll lose it. And that's, that's generally about right. Three or four years, you start to lose uh, some of the Johnson grass in a, in a pasture. Now, if you're doing controlled management intensive grazing, this may not work for you the same way. But uh, to me, if you've got Johnson grass, utilize it while you have it. Just keep those precautions in place. But, you know, the more that it's, um, uh, you know, the more that you actually are grazing down or, or mowing down those uh, lower, you know, down to a lower stem, sometimes you can start to weaken that plant. Since the growing point's about four to eight inches above the ground, uh, if you keep the, um, you know, if you keep that height below at least a foot or 12 inches, uh, the rhizome development is going to be minimized. And so you're weakening it every time you're, you're grazing it. Um, from a uh, chemical standpoint, you could use a weed wiper. You can use, uh, you know, spot treatment or full re renovation with glyphosate or glyphosate select. Uh, combination. And that that's a good starting point. Fairly inexpensive to use a, a weed wiper or spot treatment. A little more expensive doing full renovation of a pasture. But just realize you're not going to get it with one pass. Uh, it's just not going to happen. You will weaken it, but, but you've got to do these things multiple times. And so, you know, spot treating works pretty good using your drone to spray, that, if you've got that technology available, uh, that's, that's an option. Uh, but uh, spot treatment is probably one of the most common ways of dealing with patches of Johnson grass if you're trying to get rid of them. Weed wipers are also popular. Um, and I think they work really well for what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the pictures on the right are from a, a producer in Ozark, Missouri, that uh, you know mounted some, a weed wiper on the front of his front end loader. And uh, so, you know, these are just different ways of addressing it. You can put it on the back or you can put it on the front. There's reasons to do it one way or the other. But uh, uh, weed wipers, I think, are a really good, inexpensive way to address the problem. As far as the herbicide options that are out there, uh, these are the ones that I know in pastures, particularly warm and, and in some cases cool season grass pastures, these are the options that we have. Outrider has become fairly popular to address. It's a little bit pricey. Crider, I understand, is now available in parts of the state, which is a uh, generic form of Outrider, sulfuron. 
and uh, quite a bit cheaper. But these are some of the options that are available in Bermuda grass, some of the native grass species, and um, depending upon what the label says, fescue. And so I have to admit the labels are a little bit vague at times, but uh, um, in some cases you can use, use it on fescue at lower rates. Uh, pastora can be used in Bermuda grass. I realize some of our listeners are from North Missouri. This would not be something you'd be using, but uh, panoramic is another one for Bermuda grass and native grasses as well. And these have some effect as well on Bermuda grass or, or Johnson grass. Uh, this is a picture I got from uh, a producer in Greene County. You can kind of see the effect of sulfur sulfuron or outrider or crider. Um, you're going to get this purpling and the yellowing uh, effect on the plant. But notice what's, this, what's happening to the fescue as well. So you're getting uh, some injury to the fescue in some cases. So you want to keep your, your rates a little bit low. We generally... Um, apply somewhere around three quarters to one ounce per acre. Uh, in some cases, one and a third ounce per acre on Bermuda grass. But you can apply uh, those rates on um, pasture to uh, address this problem and use a surfactant with it. Um, it not only works on Johnson grass, but it works on nut sedge, it works on cheat, and it works on downy brome. So, so it's something to consider as well. We have found that the most effective time to apply it is on first growth Johnson grass prior to seed head development. Now, if you are a hay, got a hay field you're trying to address, this may not work very well. But, uh, you know, get some growth on that Johnson grass. Uh, probably needs to be three or four feet tall, preferably, to get the most active um, uh, use of that chemical and get it into the root system. And so um, you've got to realize that with all those rhizomes that are in the in the root system, it is difficult when you've got very little uh, leaf surface area on the top of the ground to absorb that chemical, get it down the stem and get it into the root system and all the way through those rhizomes. That's why it's so difficult to get a chemical control of Johnson grass. Remember that it, it can be injurious to fescue and other cool season grasses, and in some cases, some of the warm season grasses as well. You know, you know rotating out and, and renovating, all this can help uh, address the problem. You know, doing a spray smother spray to uh, take out some of the uh, Johnson grass that's in a fescue, that's, that's, that's a that helps the situation, but I can't guarantee that that's going to get it all. Now, I want to kind of wrap up by talking about how to manage it as a forage. A lot of folks have probably grew up on a farm where they, you know, it was a, it was a cuss word basically to say the word Johnson grass, but I found that a, more and more people have learned to just uh, live with it. Uh, because it is so prolific across the state. And, and I'm, I'm of that opinion myself, that if we, have, if we have it on the farm, utilize it as a forage until maybe it goes away over time. So it is a consistent performer as a forage in, on our, in, in our property. And so, you know, from a grazing perspective, we generally, you know, start grazing it at about 12 or 18 inches, sometimes higher if it's a drought. And we'll pull off at about six or eight inches. If you want to keep it going, you don't graze it down to the ground. You, you kind of have to take care of it from that standpoint. Um, I do think that we have to bear in mind that we're really, we really don't want it to go to seed. It, it, it's going to, but it's, we, we want to minimize the seed uh, from a legal standpoint. And so, you know, clipping it uh, can help reduce the seed and it can also kind of keep it vegetative. And then we got to take those precautions I talked about earlier around first frost. From a hay perspective, uh, it can be quite productive. F two to five tons is, is probably typical per acre. A conditioner is needed. Um, we want to minimize our nitrate rates, even though it would respond to much more than what we're giving it. Uh, but 40 to 50 pounds is kind of where I'm at on, on putting nitrogen on per acre. Um, 
at any given time. So even though it would probably respond to 100 or 150 pounds, we don't want to put that on and then have no rain and end up with a toxic situation. Um, but generally, uh, I would say harvest it in the boot stage or at 40 inches, somewhere in there. And then um, uh, I think that it can be a very good hay production for you um, if you don't just keep letting it go to seed. And that's, that's difficult because it seeds out very prolifically and very often. And I'm going to say that probably every three weeks, and that's not popular with a lot of people, but if you want to keep it from going to seed, about every three weeks, you could potentially reduce some of the seed development and get more tonnage and actually more quality during the growing season. I've known people who have operated this way and uh, have had it as a very good forage option, and yet don't, they don't get Johnson grass seeds spread all over the farm when they're feeding it over the winter. And so this is something to consider, I think, if you've got it in your hay fields, and a lot of us in this part of the world have it, um, you know, this is an option. Now, haying it this often, I must say, could, could lead to a persistence issue. So be aware of that. I will say that if you, if you like Johnson grass and you want to keep it, uh, I just quote this data out of Tennessee on sedan grass for comparison. And that is the higher you cut it, generally the better yield you're going to get. I know that's counterintuitive at times, but, but if you look at this 10 inch cutting height, which is you know hardly ever done, but compare that to a one inch cutting height, uh, you're actually gaining yield, you're gaining more leaf and then you have less stem and your quality is gonna be there and the tonnage is gonna be there. So I find this quite interesting. And I think that this is something to consider. We need to raise our cutting heights on a lot of different, a lot of different species. So kind of to wrap up here, getting the most out of these Johnson grass fields. I find that a lot of these fields are in hay fields, but we don't get full benefit sometimes throughout the winter of warm season grasses. And so you can interseed cool season grasses into the stands if they don't already exist, such as tall fescue, such as orchard grass. You could even go with turnips or add some clover to the mix and get a little more grazing potential out of this over the winter. Uh, and then also, um, I uh, know a, a farm nearby that that has has had a basically a Johnson grass hay field as long as I can remember. And this year uh, they they drilled some wheat in there. And so uh, they actually got some benefit in the spring by having a wheat forage crop out of that. And then later on the Johnson grass comes back. So you know there are ways of uh, getting more benefit out of a out of a piece of ground that's infested with Johnson grass than just for summer grazing or hay. So that's uh, Jill, that's uh, all I've got ske uh, uh, scheduled today to talk about, but I'd be happy to address questions if there are any. Sure, thanks, Tim. Uh, we really appreciate that. With this high, hot, dry weather we're having, um, it's kind of good to know what we're dealing with there. Matt, are there any questions for Tim? Jill, we do have some questions for Tim. The first one is if we make silage hay, is there a, a certain time to wait to know the nitrate concentration has gone down to a safe level or what should we do to ensure we are feeding potentially um, toxic haylage? Yes, uh, Matt, that's a great question uh, because you, you do have to worry about that, particularly in drier conditions. Um, the good news about silage or haylage is that um, generally it will lower the nitrate levels, you know, maybe 20 to 50%. So that's one of the best things you can do if you have a high nitrate situation. Um, if you're concerned about nitrates, it's always best to take a test, send it to a laboratory and have it analyzed um, and determine the quantitative level of nitrates at, at the time of cutting or shortly before. And that gives you a perspective of where you're at and if it's even a concern. But, but compared to haying Johnson grass or sedan grass or millet uh, that are high in nitrates, uh, 
making baleage or, or haylage of some kind out of that is your best bet. Okay, great. Uh, another kind of follow-up question to that is, are certain classes of livestock more susceptible to nitrate toxicity? I do think that there's some truth to that. Um, livestock, cattle, cattle in particular, I think seem to be the most susceptible. Uh, we don't seem to see a lot of problems with horses. We don't seem to see a lot of problem with sheep and goats. I think that it could, could occur in, in extreme situations, but it's mainly the, the, the beef or the dairy cattle that we have the most issue with. Okay, just kind of looking down to see if there's any other questions here. Um, here's one, if I have Johnson grass growing in a Milo crop that will be grazed in the winter, if it received 125 pounds of nitrogen, do I need to test for nitrates before strip grazing? I definitely would test for nitrates um, before strip grazing because the nitrate level can continue unless we have some pretty good rain later in the season and kind of gets things flowing again. Um, I think that's always a good idea. That's, that's, a, that's a little bit of concern with uh, grazing Milo uh, in the winter months, uh, as well as if Johnson grass is in it, either or. So I think that's a good, uh, that's a good plan of action is to do some testing, particularly as, after frost, you know where you're at at that point you know what you're dealing with. Most of the time, I think you're gonna be fine, particularly when we start getting some fall rains um, as the growing season starts to end. Most of the time, I think we'll be fine unless maybe we have a, a drought during the fall. Good Tim, question. One question. Tim, one question about how do we uh, find out if nitrate concentrations are a concern? Um, you can take um, four samples um, there, there's a couple of options in some of the counties, uh, not all, but some of the counties around the state, there are some nitrate uh, quick tests that can be done in extension centers with an agronomist. Um, you'll just need to call ahead and see if that's an option where you'd bring basically the lower stock in uh, and have tested uh, for a quick test. But um, the best way to do this is to take forage samples of the forage that they'll be eating, the leaves, upper stems, and uh, send that in uh, to a laboratory uh, that does forage testing and have a test run that way. And they can give you a pretty good idea of where you stand on the nitrate levels. Very good. I think it covers most of the questions. I would note that Dr. Bailey uh, put in the chat that pregnant females are the most susceptible to nitrate toxicity. Jill, that's all oh, the yes. question. Yes, that's a great point. I'm glad, I'm glad he put that in there because the pregnant females are a big concern. I was thinking species here. Uh, Jill, I think, that's, yeah. happen. I think that covers all the questions. Great. Okay. Well, if, again, if you have more questions, feel free to keep typing them in the chat. Um, you can also find a recording of this on our MUIPM YouTube channel. So I just, as we wrap up, I want to thank Tim and Pat for their time today. And I want to remind everyone again, you can view or share this week's recording as well as all our past recordings on our MUIPM YouTube page. And uh, again, I'd like to encourage everyone to join us next week, July 1st, um, so we can hear feeding cattle in Missouri, the results from the MU Thompson Research Center with Dr. Eric Bailey, University of Missouri Extension State Beef Specialist. And just want to thank everyone for your time today and hope we can catch you again next week.